Hi guys. Hi. Good Hi. afternoon. I'm so glad you made it here today. Here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the upcoming programs at the library. Mm -hmm. We have the poetry contest that is still going on. March 15th, get your poems in by then. Um, that is the deadline. Uh, it just has to be an original poem that you wrote. I got mine in yesterday. You sure did. Yeah. Yes. So we're having coffee and conversation, our monthly coffee and conversation. Our next one is Thursday, March 21st at 2 o'clock p.m. And we're going to have some experts in to talk about resources for brain health. <laughs> so if you're interested in finding out more how to keep your brain healthy, this is a good place to come. We're going to stimulate you with some coffee and have some treats, and we'll have a great conversation. So our book this month is uh, The Journey of Caroline Olson. We have those available for you to check out if you're interested in that. And we have the author coming who is going to talk to us on March 25th at 1 o'clock p.m. about her book and also about her ancestors who were Norwegian, who immigrated to Iowa um, back in the 1800s. Wow. So she's going to be talking about the immigration, her book, and all that kind of stuff. So that's March 25th at 1 o'clock p.m. And that is Anne Hannigan Cotts. So we are so excited to have the Clay County Farm Bureau partner with the library and do this March series with us. Every Wednesday at 2 o'clock p.m. we will be having a new series and new talk uh, about a different subject in the world of farming. Uh, this is for those of you who really don't know a lot about farming, maybe because you came from a city or a suburb, um, or if you were on the farm a long time ago and things have changed drastically since when you were grew up and you were on the farm because things are always changing on the farm just like technology the farm has technology and things are moving quickly so right now we have people from the clay county farm bureau they're not just people they are farmers they are working out in the fields and they are going to talk to you all about what it takes to be a farmer from the very beginning of farming, planting, um, to the very end when you're harvesting, and also animals too. Um, right now, March 6th, we have Leo Steffes and Tyler Tessum, and they're gonna be talking about the planting portion of um, farming and also spraying those plants. So, welcome. Okay, so a little introduction. Uh, I, I uh, farm full time. Um, I have approximately a thousand acres of cropland, and that'd be about 500 acres of soybeans, 500 acres of corn. Um, I have some alfalfa and uh, some sheep. So I land about 220 ewes every spring, and uh, so that's what keeps me busy. Um, that's what's going on kind of right now. Um, you know, over the years, there's. Uh, a lot of different farming practices that have become more modern and uh, hopefully we'll go through some of that today the modern side of it and Leo might talk about some of the you know past uh, practices and, and, and methods that were used um, if you have any questions at any given point ask them right away um, we'd love to have questions a lot easier than standing up here just talking so um, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the more modern stuff Leo <laughs> he's seasoned <laughs> so, so, so it's not gray; it's white. <laughs> it's white. So, so uh, that's a little bit about me and Leo. Yeah, my name's Leo Steffes. Uh, I'm a uh, semi-retired farmer. I'm just 150 acres now. I work really hard at it. Uh, years past, uh, I used to do everything: spraying, planting, all works. Now I'm a no-till farmer, and we'll get into that later. I've been doing that for. They're all almost 40 years now. Wow. Uh, I'll get into that. Uh, one thing I want to say, if you guys have any questions at any time, don't be afraid to ask, because that's what we're here for, to give you information. A uh, uh, little bit on my background, I can remember watching my dad plant corn with a two-row planter with a team of horses with the old wire that struck the right. field, check the corn. and. Uh, starting uh, you know, putting up hay when I wasn't big enough to push the clutch on the tractor. Mm -hmm. Dad had a rope and a, and a way to pull, turn the clutch off. So uh, 
just I've been through a lot of sin from one horse or two horse platter up to these 42, 36, 42 row platter now, and uh, a lot of changes. So, Tyler, if you have any questions about the background, boy, uh, I've seen a lot of it. <laughs> Yep. So there's a lot of theories, methods, you know, choices when it comes to farming. Um, choices can be wrong. Um, the theories and methods, there's really no right or wrong way to farm. Um, there's pros and cons to every way of farming. Leo's going to tell you his, that his is the right way and, you know, somebody else might tell you theirs is the right way. Both of them end up with the same product, yeah. feeding the world. Um, but. They, they both get the job done either way. So, um, like I say, there's lots of choices and things. Um, on my farm, I rotate crops, meaning I plant corn in that field one year, I plant soybeans in that same field the next year. So half of my acres are corn, half of my acres are soybeans, and they switch every year. And uh, there's, mul there's multiple reasons. Uh, Leo, you want to talk about the well, reason we'd rotate? There's uh, effects of corn on corn and corn over the time. The uh, certain diseases can build up by breaking the cycle, have corn, soybeans, and there's an advantage of corn falling soybeans because soybeans naturally pr produce nitrogen and put the nitrogen that the corn can use. Um, the, number, the number one thing that corn needs to make yield is nitrogen. So that's yeah. why the nitrogen that the beans produce is utilized by the corn is very important. Go ahead. Yeah. So I want to step back in time just a little bit. <clears throat> I can remember the time uh, that John Deere came out with a attachment on the planter to put fertilizer on. And uh, years ago, farmers had corn, oats, meadow, meadow. Because every farm you went on to around the area, they had cattle, they, they had stock cows, or dairy cattle, most farms had dairy, and pigs and chickens. So they had their own fertilizer. And then uh, when they started in the late uh, 50s or the middle 50s, they started pulling away from livestock on farm, going to more confinement stuff, the uh, need for fertilizer become evident. And I want to give you an example of what fertilizer can do. I met a gentleman up at Esterville picking up a load of fertilizer one day. He says, I'm farming on a uh, share, crop share with a farmer. And he said, I got a new John Deere planter with uh, had fertilizer attachment on it. So the uh, landlord said, oh, I don't want to spend the money. So the guy says, okay. So he bought fertilizer and put it in two rows. So now he's going through the field. He's got four rows of fertilizer, four with none. And the farmer comes out in August and says, what's going on? Yellow, green, short, tall yellow, green, short, tall, and the tenant says, mine and yours. <laughs> and, you need to explain and, uh, sharecropping, Leo. Pardon? You need to explain sharecropping. Sharecropping, at that time, used to be uh, years ago, rather, right now people are a lot of cash rent. Sharecropping was that the landlord and the tenant both paired, uh, <clears throat> shared all the expenses with corn, fertilizer, uh, seed, <clears throat> everything they shared it so they got 50 50. some of them went on a 20 percent basis uh, they would take 20 or 25 percent of the crop the farmer would take and furnish all the inputs but with this back in the 40s when they start farms started consolidating a lot of sharecropping was done that's a good question there um, so if i can interject here um you know he talks about a lot about uh the history, you know, and the, and the um, yields and things of back in the day with a horse and with the different things. Let's put that in perspective. Uh, corn weighs 56 pounds a bushel, okay? So a bushel of corn is 56 pounds of kernels of corn. Today, my farm produces over 200 bushels of corn per acre. Oh, wow. so, so if you figure that out, so the bushel of corn has never changed. So you have a bushel of corn is 56 today, 56 back in 1940. Pounds. Yep, pounds. Leo, what was the yield 
back in 1940-ish or, or throughout some of your well, earlier farming days. days. Or through some of your farming days even. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Well, so I'm over 200. Um, I think there's over 300 in our local area, bushel per acre. When, when I was young, 50 bushel acre corn was good crop. In uh, the 60s when I started farming on my own, uh, 1961 was our first crop year, and uh, if you got 75 or 80 bushel, you had a whale of a crop. And uh, at that time, uh, 30 bushel beans, 35 bushel beans at that time. Now they're getting 50, 60 bushel beans, and he's mentioned over 200. I, I live in a different part. Average year was 170 last year. 180 the year before and 200 the year. So there's a variance. You, water makes a big difference. Oh, so. soil type. Soil, soil type, type. oh yeah, yeah. He, uh, I'm in uh, rolling ground. Some of these got real flat ground, makes a difference on it. I got a question, Neil. Yes. And nobody ever told me, but what type of soil is the seed? Why don't I get to see fields of oats anymore? Seals of fields of oats. Fields of oats. Fields of oats. Yeah. oats. Well, one thing, you go to farms, how many farms, if you don't have cattle, you don't need the alfalfa. You, you put oats in alfalfa to start to protect the alfalfa when you seed the alfalfa, and we just don't have the cattle on, on the farms anymore. Right. They're all confinement. Pardon? Really? Your, your poorer acres used to have the oats on them. And the poorer acres have now become what we call CRP or set aside acres, and uh, that would be hunting ground and things like that that have been purchased by the DNR and uh, and uh, farmers own it and they get paid by the government to have those acres, and that is the type of ground you would generally have had oats at, um, same as wheat. Um, if you go out in the Dakotas, in the Dakotas there is lots of oats and wheat out that way because their ground is not as prosperous as ours is. Um, and that uh, creates uh, an economic threshold of why you don't produce oats because they're not worth as much as corn and soybeans are when you can produce more corn and soybeans around here. I should have asked you before you start, what got both of you into farming? Because it is quite a commitment, but not worth to get family that did. I recognize the Tesla name, Everly, but yep. did you do that family, Leo and Tyler? Well, I, I grew up on a farm. When I went to college, uh, I majored in animal science, but my goal was to, I loved hogs, I loved, uh, my dad used to uh, raise, uh, had 40 sows, he feral twice a year, once in the spring, once, and that was a big herd at that time. But it was just, um, like some kids want to be a pilot, some kids want to be a doctor, I just wanted to be a farmer all my life. Hmm. And uh, that's uh, it's just inbred into me. And good question. I I, um, I I grew up on a farm and always wanted to farm. Um, we played tractors up in our <laughs> yeah in our bedrooms and stuff, you know, on the carpet and all that kind of stuff. And I always wanted to be a farmer. Never thought I'd have an opportunity. And so I um, always thought maybe I might when my dad retires, which is still another 20 years out, uh, might take over his small chunk of land. He doesn't have enough to make a full-time farming operation. Uh, but I got an opportunity to um, take on farming. And so I, I spent 13 years um, working. I was a network admin and then started farming uh, eight years ago. So I'm fairly new to the farming uh, like in, uh, investment, but I've been farming my whole life as far as that goes. But to build on Leo's thing, when you were talking, you were barely old enough to push down the clutch when you're bailing hay. And so it, it's kind of like how it was when I was a kid. If you're old enough to walk, you're old enough to work. Well, and so you yeah. just, when you, uh, you grow up on a farm, they, they came up with a way to make it so that you could work. Okay. And help out. Mention. And so it just gets, like you say, bred into you. It's, you don't know anything else. Yeah, I, I drove tractors when it was uh, getting back old. We used to cultivate corn. And we cultivated lengthways, and then they checked corn, you cultivated it crossways. One Memorial Day, we were going to have a picnic. Now I'm about uh, eight years old. And uh, 
No, I'm I'm crying every day. Dad, let me go out the field with you. Let me. Uh, I could ride with him, but Memorial Day, the wind was blowing and it was cutting the corn off. So Dad says, "Okay, we're gonna go out cultivate." He puts me on a cultivator. He widens it out. He said, "Now just follow me." And we stripped the field so we got black soils, dark soil, so it wouldn't cut it off the sand. So now I'm crying because I can't get to go to the picnic. But uh, I thought, okay, this is a one-day affair. Comes in at that night, Dad says, okay, Leo, you did a pretty good job. You'll do that from now on. So uh, that's part of my story why I went to no-till. I'll come that later. You need, but, uh, you need to explain what cultivate is. Pardon? You need to explain what cultivate is. Yeah. Oh, what, what is cultivate? cultivator? Okay, you have a bunch of sweeps there. V-shaped, they cut through the soil, and they cut the weeds off, and it moves the dirt, it moves the dirt a little bit into, imagine the rows, so, so it follows the road, yeah. and you see this black spot right here. The, there's a V that would take and clear that black spot and turn that soil only, but not turn where the row is. Okay. And then, you, and on corns, that you can look down the, this way, and the corn is the way, and when they cross the corn with the old wire, you could go across the field. Well, you had to cultivate lengthways, crossways, and if you didn't get it done, Picking was no fun, so you had to cultivate this three so times. Imagine the headstones in Arlington. <laughs> yeah, that's how the corn. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're getting on. These are good questions. I'm going to talk a little bit now about fertilizer. Uh, we fertilized back when they had the cattle and hogs and stuff. Farmers had their own fertilizer that they could put on. With the corn, oats, meadow, meadow, it didn't take as much fertilizer for the corn because uh, we had the oats and metamel to help build up nitrogen stuff. But uh, now the farmer, you just don't randomly go out and pick. We know how many, 200 bushels requires so many units of nitrogen, so many units of phosphorus, so many units of potash, and then uh, micronutrients, sulfur, and things like that are have to come in. So we take soil tests every four years. You take soil tests, and it tells you how much uh, the nutrients you required to get you up to your, you put a yield goal, and the, how many nutrients you have to do to do that with a soil test. And then also, uh, used to be people would put fertilizer on with at corn, corn bean rotation, they put all the fertilizer on the corn, and the second year the beans got to carry over. Now a lot of us are fertilizing both every year, the corn and the soybean, both, so we can actually get make sure we get the nutrients that are required for each one there. But it, it's just not willy-nilly. Here's what they go in and they go about six inches deep and go all around the farm and now GPS, they know exactly where they're taking them and they put this in, send in, you get the test. You also have to, your lime uh, calcium level has to be right to get the maximum yields there. So uh, any questions on that? Yeah. Farming's really become a science more than it is a uh, uh, a way of life even anymore. I mean, you, you, you definitely live and breathe it, but uh, there are so many things that make farming so productive today that uh, following things like soil uh, analysis and things like that, um, you know, they'll go around and probe uh, 12 probes, approximately 9 to 12 probes in an area, and then that'll be a two and a half acre grid, that area will be. And that grid will then come back and it's all GPS. So you, you know this two and a half acre grid will need this much. And, and now it's all variable rate. So you can literally go through a field and apply what that two and a half acres needs, but the next two and a half might not, you don't apply that. And so those are, uh, like I say, it's, it's become a science. Oh, it's become a real science. Right. You just, well, with the inputs you've got anymore, and the expenses you have, you have to maximize your dollars that you spend, and that's a way of doing it on it. Um, we mentioned crop rotation, part of rotation. Years ago, it goes back to the crop rotation. You had that corn, oats, meadow, meadow, because you had livestock. You had to feed all the livestock. Now we don't have that. So some farmers are continuous corn. I've been through that once, continuous corn versus corn soybeans. Um, you take and manage your crop to do uh, <clears throat> each one. 
uh, you want to talk about different uh, crops you might see here locally? Yeah, they're locally. They're, some of their uses? <clears throat> Mainly corn and soybeans. Years ago, uh, things really got bad. A number of people tried doing vegetable crops here. Well, there's a reason why they didn't work. Number one, our uh, neighbor put in peas. First year, it worked great. Second year, when they're ready to harvest, you have to harvest it. Well, second year they did it, it rained, and the peas got too mature. They do it. Another thing, they couldn't get through the field. Another big thing is, they thought, well, okay, we're going to start growing vegetable crops. Where's the market? You have to go to the uh, Dakotas in Minnesota to get a market. So you can think this is great, but if you don't have a processing plant or market, you're done. You can't do it there. So, so there's, there's people right now in my area that, uh, and east of me just ways, they're into organic farming. Well, that's fine. Uh, they get a premium, but I'm going to put a big but. Uh, they they have a real problem of keeping control of the weeds because they can't use chemicals, and chemicals whether you like them or not, they, that's that saves a lot of soil and stuff. For them. I'll come into that later the pro, on. The pro the pros of organic farming would be uh, the market is there to get three times. Yeah. what a regular bushel of corn or a regular bushel of soybeans is worth for that organic bushel. The cons are weed control and yield. Uh, a lot of the guys who are doing organic may not get 60 bushel soybeans, they may get 40. And so you have less yield, but you get three times the money for each of those bushels. And so they're, they're out there, they're, they plow the ground, they level it off, they cultivate it, two, three times. They walk, have to walk the beans. Uh, chem, chemicals won't. Uh, no chemicals, no, chemicals. no GMO. Um, genetically modified seed generally. Uh, yeah. It's it's all uh, it has its old, place. It's, it's uh, old school. Most of us can't afford to do it that way. So and you, it's 1910. Yes. Speaking of seed, about how much does a bag of uh, corn and beans cost, and how many acres can a bag plant? Well, I'll answer your question, but it's later. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. I'll talk about seed here after a second, and I will answer those questions. Uh, um, no. Okay, so uh, basically, some of the top producing in our area you'll see is corn and soybeans. And, and corn, its general use would be feeding livestock yeah. and producing ethanol. So we have local ethanol plants in our area. Uh, there's an ethanol plant in Hartley, which is fairly close to here. Albert City has one. Um, there's a couple other small ones up by, yep. Yeah, there's uh, Emmitsburg and, and uh, Superior, I believe, has a small ethanol plant. But um, that's one of the number one uses. What am I looking at right there? What's so this, this is soybeans after they're harvested in a uh, wagon from the field. So this is corn, the picture's not very good. This, what is that? It, this is corn in a, so so the kernels of corn all in a, in a semi. So this is just Go corn. back to your back picture. Guy harvesting here, this combine will hold from 250 to 400 bushel of grain in the tank. And each rather than run up here to the wagon, we've got now grain carts they run through. Now, uh, they run through the field and they unload on the go into this grain cart. And the grain cart then is usually a two wheel, some of them have tracks now, and they run through the field, and then the truck or wagon that sits here that's all the town, they come and dump it into here. This happens to be beans in this one here. And there'll be a harvest system, a harvest guys that'll come in and talk about the harvest side. I don't want to ruin any of their yeah. uh, <laughs> thunder, you know, that we talked about everything. But that's okay. so you mentioned, next week. That's next. next. That's next Sorry. Week, right? <laughs> you mentioned corn for feed and ethanol. We don't eat our corn? Uh, generally, we do not eat our corn. Well, uh, sweet corn is the sweet corn. Wheat. Corn oil meal. Uh, yeah, that's from corn. There's a lot of byproducts that we uh, utilize. Yeah, starches corn. are made from corn. Corn corn meal is made corn bread out of. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, but very small. Very, I couldn't tell you the accurate. Maybe five to ten percent of the corn is goes into food products. 
they well, grow well, well, here, but in Texas or down south, they grow the like for the corn chips and stuff like that, right? Yeah. It's different corns for right. corn chips, right. yeah. yeah. The specialty crops. Uh, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Mention when I started, hey, he mentioned bale. When I started uh, driving that tractor, Whisper, drive, Dad would cut the hay, windrow it into a windrow, and we'd drive, and then they had a wagon, a bundle wagon, which uh, that, a bundle wagon is when they used to cut oats, put it into a bundle, and then they shock them up into stacks. There'd be six or eight bundles to each one. And then uh, they would haul that into a thrash machine. But uh, the hay then, uh, behind the wagon, you had this wagon is probably 24 foot long, and you had uh, ropes that laid in the bottom of the wagon. They called them a sling. Laid in the bottom of the wagon, and on the back of the wagon there was a loader, and it come along and pick up the hay, and put it into the back of the wagon. And my dad would have to, or the farmers would have to take my fork, put it forward to the front of the wagon, and put it in. And after it got so deep, it'd get about this deep, then they put another row of uh, slings. They would have three slings to a load. Then you'd haul it to, t to the house, and uh, in the barns they had tracks, and a rope uh, mechanism come down, and you'd hook the ropes up to it, and the horses would pull this rope. Our barn was 60 foot long. So 60 foot, and then it had to drop down 25, 30 feet, and then had, so I suppose that rope was uh, 120 feet long. And you hook a team of horses on, it would pull the, the hay up in the hay mile, and they'd pull the lever, and the, the strings would let loose, and then they'd pull back out. And it, it was quite a process to do. But it always good for kids because you, the first job you had was pulling, the, the horse would pull it out, they would unhook the horse, and then you would stand there and pull this rope back because the guy had pull it clear like the barn. You didn't want the friction of pulling that. I'm rattling on, but <laughs> see a lot of change. Um, we talked about the seed, oh, the seed now. Yeah, yeah I'll go through some of that. Uh, so um, when you go to produce a crop, the first thing you've got to look at is fertility, but then the seed choice. So there's Lots of seed choices you can have. Uh, of course, corn and soybeans are what I'm gonna focus on. Um, they're what most people in this area would yeah. focus seed oh. choices on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you get hats. <laughs> but, uh, so there's a lot of things like in corn that determine which kind of seed you're going to, uh, to plant. So there's day, so Corn is grown by how many day, how many growing green units it takes to. You want to help her? You, know, or you got her? Okay. Um, how many uh, growing degree units it takes from when it's planted to when it's harvested and mature? And so um, the modernization of grain dryers and uh, uh, being able to dry your grain at an elevator or wherever else uh, has, has allowed farmers to utilize a longer maturing day corn. So um, years ago, you used to basically when it got dry in the field from the air, you harvested your field. And now you go out there when it's a little bit wet and harvest it Good. and then bring it in and dry it artificially. See our corn, if you look at a corn and they've got another rating, they, on the seed I'll tell you it's a 90 day, 100 day, 110 day, 140 day. In this area, a lot of 100 to 110 day corn is planted. You get it up northern Dakota, they might be to an 85 day corn. You get down southern Iowa, it's 150, 60 day corn. Uh, and that's the heat units is what it is. Their beans is, beans, we have maturity rates on beans also. One nine uh, is a real common, don't ask me, it's the number of days. Beans, okay, corn goes through a cycle. Beans have our day length. And you, you start going through a, a field in the fall and you'll see a field of green beans and a field of yellow beans. It's strictly day length. Well, actually it's night length. It's what it is they call day length. 
And the good Lord, when he's designed beans, he designed a, uh, their maturity according to how long that uh, they'll take a certain amount of sunlight, and then they start turning. And genetic breeding, they control that now. So, yep. so, so a few more things that would uh, influence your choice of, of uh, seed would be the yield. So there's, there's corn and soybeans that yield better than another, and uh, a lot of times they're more offensive versus defensive. So when I talk about offensive, they're susceptible poten potentially to pests, uh, disease, um, and things like that. Uh, the defensive ones are hardier. They are more less susceptible to pests and disease. Yeah. Generally speaking, that's how, how your yield is done. So if you have a field that uh, maybe we talked about uh, lime earlier mm -hmm. and uh, maybe your uh, pH level is uh, low or high, you might select a certain soybean to fit that pH level and that'll actually yield better than the wrong choice into that field. Um, another uh, thing that you would choose uh, soybeans by would be chemical tolerance. So in today's era, there are lots of different choices of chemicals that you can use. Um, they're all genetically modified to be able to have a tolerance to certain chemicals. But if you choose uh, this seed over here and you put this chemical on it, it's dead. And so. Um, if you choose this seed over here and the chemical that goes for it, you will have a weed-free field in general. But uh, that choice has to be made when you're plant when you're plant before you're planting, so that you know what you're spraying on the, those that seed. Yeah. Are you researching that yourself? Are you paying someone to give you advice? How are you making? I've There's a lot of different decisions. Mm -hmm. I've done it all on my own. Uh, there's farm managers who will help uh, farmers do that. Um, there's the geneticists work in these traits uh, genetically. It's, it's each seed you get is genetically modified to take certain chemicals or not. Yeah. So there's a uh, so there's a lots of information and data on each seed and each variety of seed. So if you got a book of a DeKalb um, seed corn book, uh, there might be 200 varieties of yeah. seed corn for our area. You know, that when, I'm, when Leo's talking that 100 to 110 day, there's maybe 200 varieties. And, and so you throw a dart and you figure, <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. Uh, Talk to your neighbors also. So, so your seed so representative. You got, so you're not, you're not dripped. Yes. Yep. Uh, so your seed representative will tell you, um, in our area, this last year did really well. It was in a test plot, and a test plot is a whole bunch of different. You'll see them driving by on the road. There's signs of like seed seed corn signs that says decal this 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 each number, and that test plot is a side to side comparison between the varieties. And so your uh, seed representative will say, I'd recommend this one, and, and you can just choose whatever he says or you can choose your own either way. Tyler, on uh, corn, I plant 34,000 plants per acre and uh, that's in 30 inch rows that I have. What do you plant? In that uh, same row. What kind of a price per book? So you get about, right now he mentioned a bushel, used to be 56 pounds to a bushel, now you buy 80,000 kernels. Yep. So, so you could have more kernels. And years ago, they sold it by the bushel. And so, the one I've mainly heard was soybeans. Yeah. But a uh, bushel of soybeans weighs 60 pounds. And uh, if you had little bitty so soybean seed, each one of those seeds would still produce a plant. And so, if you had little soybean seeds, you got more seeds than if you had big soybeans. And so. Um, guys would literally look for a small soybean seed so they got a better bang for their buck. Today, it's 140,000 soybean seeds in a, in a unit. And so that'd be a bag of soybean seeds it has 140,000, not no more, no less, you know. Now, how, how, many, bean, how many beans do you put the acre? Well, um, I do narrow road soybeans. So we'll talk about that after a bit here, I believe, but um, basically, you can do 30 inch rows as a standard. That's what a wheel fits down. And then they make narrow row beans, which are 15 inch rows or 10 inch rows or seven and a half inch rows. So they're fairly close to each other. And 
there's benefits to um, having the narrow rows, and then there's cons to the narrow rows as well. But I, I run narrow rows, um, and so I put about 160, 165,000 um, seeds per acre out. Um, now, now, Kim and I differ. Uh, I've been that game. I went through all that, and uh, I'm down to 115,000. But I'm I'm at uh, sometimes well 15 inch rows. The uh, reason I go to narrower rows is you shade the ground quicker, and uh, by ha by spreading out having uh, all your 115 or 140 thousand whatever you have, you spread it out farther, and you'll find that the thinner the population is, the bigger the stalk is, the more hardy it is, and. Uh, and it shades the ground quicker. Now, as far as yield advantage, um, I don't believe either one's a yield. Uh, my my. So that's Leo's pros and cons why he does 115. But my pros and cons was uh, I believe that when this the soy on lighter soils, the soybean uh, density, the amount of soybeans there are, will compete with each other for sunlight, and they will grow up and close rows quicker. And so that is one reason is I believe it helps with a canopy to one, keep the moisture in the soil because it creates shade and two, it shades out any growth of weeds. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't need to interrupt you. Nope, you're good. Okay, I'm a city boy, so I have no idea what you're talking about. But where do you, don't laugh at me, but what is a corn seed and where does it come from? And why is there many different kinds of hay know which seed is which? Yep, so, so corn, corn seed, uh, so in this area you don't see a whole lot of uh, seed plots. Okay, okay. so people grow seed corn fields. just for the seeds? Yes. yes. And that's a lot in southern Iowa. So, okay. And uh, so you drive along and you see um, rows of corn with what we call the tassel, which is the, like the Man. comes up and it, you know, sprouts out. Yeah. And you see rows that have no tassel, like they've been cut off. Okay. That is a seed plant, a seed field, and that field will be har harvested for seed purpose only. So the seeds and the tassels? No, the seed no. is on the on the ear. Yeah. So there's a big ear that grows off to the side. Yeah. But the tassel is the reproductive organs of the corn plant. Okay. So you don't want. You want rows of males and rows of females, and yeah, you, you know, they'll cross pollinate. You, you eat sweet, you eat sweet corn yeah. on the ear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sweet okay. corn on the ear. Each one of those kernels is a seed. Okay. And what he mentions, we've got male rows and female rows, and they control the the hybrids by crossing two different numbers. And, and you said there's different kinds of seeds. So, uh, soybean seed and a corn seed, and, and there's different varieties of corn and soybean seeds. Okay. Yes, hundreds. hundreds. We'll leave it up to the scientists. There, it is. Yeah. Iowa, Iowa State University has uh, a lot to do with corn and soybean development uh -huh. and crossbreeding in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, how do you know which seed? Do you know by seed if they're going to be the male or the female? Or the bio I don't. Bio? I don't care because I'm just growing a field of corn. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are doing the the the, uh, the growing it for seed, mm -hmm. they they have that determination. The and individual it, seeds are not necessarily male and female. It's right. Corn itself is a. Uh, it's. It's got it's got two sexes, and the top of the tassel, which is the male part, the ear, where where the silks are, that's the female part. Because it's just like a flower that you grow in your garden, where in a flower you have your male and female parts all combined into one, so it is called a perfect blossom. So I mean, the corn plant is a imperfect blossom, where you've got the male part at the top and the female part at the bottom. But when you're growing it in a field. You cut the, the male part off at the top, and then you can take okay. and put a sack over that, and so that, that female part will only get the male part from that, from whatever yep. corn variety that you want to cross pollinate with. That way, no other corn plant can, you know, so look, say look. if you've got de uh, decal corn and then you got pioneer corn, you don't want, you know, necessarily to cross pollinate those two different. Uh, brands, 
Well, DeKalb will go out there and we're going to click on top, top of all of ours and we're going to make sure that it's only DeKalb on this or vice versa, same way. But on the commercial place, commercial farm, for what we get for seed, that's in, when he's talking about where they take and uh, cover the, the ear and, you know, silk on an ear of corn, that silk shoot out, the bottom kernels get pollinated before the top kernels do. It comes from the bottom up. But uh, for the research purpose they're doing what Mike talked, they'll take the mail and put it in a bag, put it over a, an ear that's just shooting and that. that. But the, to, to get the corn that we have, that we plant, they do it on a commercial lot where they'll have, he mentioned four rows of uh, female rows and one row of male row. And they top off the uh, po uh, females. The, the, tassel, they cut the tassel off and have that one row that's got tassel and that will, that's how they, there's two, the male is different than the female breed. They cross the two and get a hybrid and that's what they're working on. So, so corn, corn is fairly difficult. Soybeans is really simple for seed. Soybeans, you can grow seed right here. I've grown soybean seed before. The number one thing is not, not contaminating uh, two varieties together. So they, they, if they want you to grow this specific 1.9 variety of soybeans, the whole field has to be that, and you've got to clean out your tanks and your truck, your semis and everything so there's no contaminated seeds going into that. Other than that, <coughs> soybeans, literally, uh, what you put in your bin would, could grow, or haul to, to town or wherever else, could grow in the ground for a soybean plant and be oh. just as successful. Okay, we covered. Down. I give them a picture of that field you were talking about? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I'm going to... So the males or the tassels are sticking up? Here. Okay. I, we're going to get to the part that uh, I, uh, is really dear to my heart, what we're going to talk about next, is uh, no-till. Can you get that picture up? Sure. I, I need to say something here. Yeah. David had asked me a question earlier before we started this. Um, I think we could actually take an plant that's the seed that we harvest from our field, from beans or corn, if we can actually take and plant that the next year in our own field. Legally, legally you cannot. Legally? Yes, so the- oh, They've changed, that's a seed. The seed company owns the genetics of the seed. Oh, really? And so you cannot take, when you buy the seed from them, you have to sign a waiver that says you will not you keep that and replant that. Right. Um, oh, corn, you, corn around here, you wouldn't be able to do that anyway. But soybeans, that could be a real, uh, that, that would put the seed companies and all their research and their scientists and everything all out of business because um, you literally could plant the soybeans you had last year and plant them again and be, and be they grow like, and yield just like normal. When you go through, when you go through uh, the, the countryside and you see a, a field of soybeans and you see corn stalks growing up out there, that's called volunteer corn. And that is a weed in that field. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, but because of the genetics, they are resistant to certain chemicals that you would normally keep that field completely clean with. But the, that, that corn lives through. through it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take it for a while. Okay, so um, move it on because we're running short on a little short on time. I'll get through some spraying. So um, fields are not naturally weed free. They do not look like straight soybeans. If you did not spray, they would, there would be weeds everywhere and you wouldn't get a yield of, of crops. So um, there's a couple of instances you put on chemicals for soybeans um, and corn, you put a pre-emergence. So I don't know if you guys use preen in your, in your gardens ever or flower beds, but preen is a, uh, a pre-emergent. It keeps weeds from uh, germinating, weed seeds from germinating. And uh, so we put on a, not a dry version, but a wet version of, uh, of preen basically on the field and that helps before plants are grown to keep the weed bed down. Once the, once the uh, soybeans or corn get, go in the field, generally we'll spray two passes approximately on top of the crop once it's growing and that'll keep the weeds down. And then uh, a lot of farmers are uh, now spraying a third pass, which is for your insecticide and fungicide. And uh, that's for bugs and uh, fungus that may be growing. Um, a lot of insecticide and fungicide is put on via plane. So when you, in late summer, when you hear the planes going off, 
that are putting on insecticide, fungicide, on corn, soybeans, um, both. Um, if you did not, so a lot of farmers, this picture may come in, so this is a corn field here butting up to a soybean field, and uh, your corn chemicals kill your soybeans and your soybean chemicals kill your corn, and so if there are no uh, chemicals used, you can see how tall weeds are between the two because you're trying not to kill each other's crop, each, each crop, and so that's what ends up happening, is you get a, you get a wheat field and your whole, your whole field would look like that and you rarely would get any yield at all. This, this is a pet peeve of mine. I, I used to do my own spring. Chemical guys, they don't want to kill a roll of beans or a coat roll of corn, and that makes me furious because this here, you'll pay for it years, because there's millions of seeds there. Yes. And uh, I say kill a row of each one. I'll, I'll commend you for doing a good job. I will, I chew them out when they don't do it. Uh, <laughs> one, one mature like water hemp uh, plant can put out 200,000 seeds oh. that are viable. So, you know, if you had yeah. 500 water, yeah, do the math. Uh, okay, so then uh, we'll move on to tillage. Uh, Leo wanted well, to talk about different things. This, this is, uh, uh, I've got a few guys, one guy over there. Yeah, I'm getting him converted. <laughs> but this is the old style disc. I've no-tilled for about almost 40 years now, before anybody, very few. Uh, fact is, I have on my tombstone one of the first no-till farmers in Clay and Palinola County. <laughs> a gentleman by the name of Jerry Crew. Uh, him and I were one of the first two pioneers in the state. But this is uh, no-till. See, all the residue from last year is still here. This is, there, that, this is slot tilling here. Slot tilling is they go in and put fertilizer right here. Instead of broadcasting the fertilizer all over the whole field, they put it in these slots right here. Or, or it might be, they might adhere to strip till. Strip till, yeah. slot till, yeah. flip till. Yeah. It's all the same thing. So you come in and you run your planter right on these rows there. So you put your fertilizer below where your corn roots or soybean roots are going to grow at. So yeah. they they have a, if they don't get to that fertilizer, they're struggling. And so um, like when you broadcast, your root system might grow a little further out to get to fertilizer than if you're putting it right below the plant. So this is, um, it's, become, it's becoming a big deal. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a cross between what Leo talks about in no-till versus true, true conventional tillage. And so you can see the ground is undisturbed between the row, so the erosion will be less um, because it's half tilled and not fully tilled. If you look at if you look at what the disc was doing, um, you can see the ground is completely black behind it. So um, that's one one way. Um, and this is a no-till field. There's no-till. See, last year's stalks are still here. Mm -hmm. See, this ground is virtually 90 to 100 percent covered with residue. Now. My farm that I farm, I have, I go across the field now. Uh, some of these people around Royal, they have one soil type, clear across the field. I have seven different soil types in one round. I have flat ground that can drown out to a D slope, which is pretty steep slope. And I plant up and down. So I, I, I think that's my own that I've done. And that's, that's what I strive for on my whole farm. Now go on. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that's from Brazil. Okay. We well, sent that. And that there's so some this, more. This is no-till. You can see all of the the residue from the last year. So this is this is uh, soybean uh, residue left over. And then you know yes, you only take the, you only take the little seeds. You don't take the whole plant. So that's the plant sitting there, and that's the corn stalks from the year prior, um, all all still there. Why did I go to no-till? Uh, years ago, I went out and cultivated. Uh, I had to do cultivation. One of the root things here is look at this. This is a neighbor's field. And if all these rills and stuff, this is severe erosion. I mean, it's terrible. I went out and cultivated, and it wasn't a real long hill, but it was enough. We got a four inch rain that night. I went out and looked and where I cultivated. It took all the loose soil yeah. in the center and it took and washed it down the hill. And I said, right there, I'm done. I'll never cultivate again. Uh, now I have to backtrack. I did buy a special cultivator that kept the residue. I, I do that for uh, 
one or two years and then I quit completely. But uh, you cannot be a good steward of this land. God give us this land. It's my responsibility. It's his responsibility, all of us responsibility to have it as good a shape when I started farming as I end. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't, you, this they, guy doesn't get a second chance. They don't, they don't make more of it. <laughs> it it's done. So, uh, uh, and I have cultivated, it's going to the next one. Uh, this is planting, this is what a common thing now is cover crops. In the fall of the year, uh, in uh, August, uh, about f just, uh, if you could do it two weeks before fair, it'd be a great time. If you get rain, uh, if you don't get rain, it just sits there. But this is cereal rye here, and you see the uh, planting through the cereal rye, and here's the row that's been planted, and uh, it works great. It holds the moisture. Uh, you want to kill it uh, if you let it go to. I did one year real wet, and I had uh, cereal rye this tall, and uh, then it averaged probably this this height here. It averaged that. Well, they, I thought I'd go out and plant before they killed it. Well, that didn't work too well because the, uh, the planter has a uh, colders in front that uh, it takes a track for the seed to lay in. Well, those wet stalks there wrapped up and I could wring water out of them. So I had to wait about three or four days until it started to turn color. Then it worked. But, uh, <laughs> Seeing the mark without GPS, I was doing it without GPS. Uh, that was a challenge. But the nice thing about that, it has a toxic effect on the weeds, and it uh, shades the soil. It's going to stay; uh, won't get as hot. And uh, it just and on the hills, there's no soil washing and stuff. That's so, why so, I'm going so to. The roots of the cover crop will actually hold the soil together. Yep. So that when you get a downpour of rain and a heavy wash of rain, those roots are holding everything together. So uh, in his instance, where he's got slopes and hills and valleys, and he'd have it wouldn't matter if there if there was nothing growing here and you did no till, you'd likely have some corn stalks and some soil eroding, and and the, the cover crop really does hold all of that together. Uh, one thing you might ask is, and I've never done cover crop, uh, however, I've researched it enough. Yeah, yep, be like your lawn in town, yep, it's all together. In a few minutes. Yep, so um, one thing you would ask is, on a dry year, doesn't that uh, green growth take all the moisture? Yes, until you kill it. Once you kill it, it releases the moisture and the nutrients back into the soil and makes more actually than it, than it originally took up. So, so that part of it is uh, nutrient wise and Moisture-wise, is not an issue. Um, however, there, that will be an argument from some people why you would yeah. never do it. Um, I, I will say on no-till, in 1987 or 88, I forget, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to go to Brazil, and uh, I was a guest speaker on no-till farming because they had to uh, go to it because people said, we're going broke. And this, this, uh, I, I, I had pictures of when I lost them of uh, the real the soil washing away. I was in Brazil four years ago, and they're 100% no-till now in the, most of the areas now. They, uh, another thing down there, there's a crop growing 365 days a year. Uh, they, they go through it with a combine to harvest the corn or beans or cotton, and right behind the combine is a planter the same field the same day. And they, and they're, they're, well, one farm I was on, can you imagine this, 79,000 acres, one farm. And uh, it just blows your mind. And uh, they, they really, and without no-till, they, they said we can't exist. And uh, so, yes. How, how big is a uh, farm here in, Clay County, on average, like if you go a square mile, how many acres is that? Well, in a square contrast, to square miles, six hundred and forty acres, square mile. So you figure seventy-nine thousand acres. You know, that's a lot of miles yeah. by a lot of miles, depending yeah, on how. That's many. that's not the largest farm in right. Brazil, but it's the largest contiguous contiguous farm. 
all together. But they they see the value of it. Uh, I get the preaching on it. <laughs> would, would that be a family farm? That uh, a uh, usually, they could be. They could be. Some of them are. Some of them are a co-op type deal. Uh, that one there, I think, was a family farm. But they have uh, agronomists, and they have a whole crew of people. Uh, they have special people that run sprayers. A neat thing about them is their sprayers, the guys run any equipment, they take their shoes off before they get in the cabs. And they have to have, everything's clean. I mean, it's, it's but uh, they had to go to it. I've done it because my case, uh, just hobby farmer like I am now, I, I should say a hobby farmer, semi-retired, I just, uh, it works so well for me. And now one thing is cost. I can put my crop in for three tenths of a minute. Well, if I go three tenths to half a gallon an acre, I've got a friend that farms over, was it 2,000 or 2,400 acres? He does his own spraying, no till. He puts his crop in for less than a gallon an acre to get his crop in, in the, and up to harvest time. That's, uh, so it's a big fuel saver for you. Equipment wise, all you need is a planter and you need a backup uh, uh, disc so if fire comes you can just uh, disc the stuff down. Uh, <laughs> a few people uh, like to do the end rows, I don't do it. Uh, I'm not a very good farmer, so, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't disc it down. But your investment for equipment is so much less if you just have to have a planter a tractor that can pull it. Of course, cow mines are, harvesting's the same thing, whatever it is, whether it's no till or conventional. When you say, I don't, I don't know if it's disking or tilling, but I've just noticed now, this time of year, it looks like the borders of the farm have been t dark. So what's the reason that they only did like around, around the... That, that is because on the end rows, they're turning on them, and they run the grain carts up and down. So you know, they set the semi and the grain cart, okay. and they figure there's compaction there. Okay. So you get all the weight, you, all of your harvest comes to that end row on either end, and so you get That's all that harvest. weight on those end rows, and so they go through and rip them up to try to allow them to be compact. Is that, is that disking or is that tilling? Or it might, there's not even that term. Well, that's tilling. Till that's tilling. With a, okay. yeah. yeah, tillage is, uh, is a generic term. So um, they might be using a, a V ripper or a disc ripper or something of that nature, but probably doing some sort of a deep tillage, I would call it. Whereas disking is round discs that. Yeah. So that, you're not going to plant there then? That yes, you will. They will still they'll they'll, uh, they'll, they'll come plant. in and they'll level that out okay. with like a field cultivator or a vertical till it's or something. It's sort of like rototilling your garden. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Now, okay. They're, they, some of them are going away from their, they, what's the new term for, instead of having a disc, they, they have individual discs spread out. Vertical till. Vertical till. Uh, the disc, if you see road construction, how do they pack the soil? They use the disc. And on all these, road construction, there's a big disc that they run over. So if you're out in the field with your disc, what are you doing? You're compacting the soil. Now these vertical till, uh, well, I, I have problems with them, but that's, that's my personal deal. But it works, you know, there, so. Something else about the cover crop and then leaving the residue, it helps build your organic matter. Yes. Back in the 1800s or whatever, the organic matter was tremendously high, and over the years it just keeps going down and down. So this would be. Yeah, I believe that's because they down. used to put manure on their fields, yeah. and the manure has a lot of organic matter. And to not, and then today it's all commercial fertilizer, and so there's zero organic matter in that. And so over the years, that organic matter is, is depleted uh, slowly, but it does. And so leaving your residue. Um, and the residue of the cover crop it helps Farm, that. Farms that I farm versus 20, 30 years ago, organic matter with my no-till, my organic matter has, in, now it's not really dramatic, but my organic matter is increasing, which is a good thing. What uh, are you doing right now? Yeah. Ready. Right now? I'm, I've got all my seed bought, all my chemicals bought, 
Um, basically, I'm, I'm lining my use out right now, and uh, most guys would be going through equipment, um, change, uh, changing engine oils, uh, making sure everything's up to snuff, you know, prepared to go. I've got all that ready to go, being as I knew I had to lamb um, the end of January and February, tail end of the So the next week or so, I'll probably get some equipment out and looking it over one more time. And I will when the, when the day's the plan, I'll hook on the planner and go to work. Uh, Tyler, we never mentioned the cost of seed. Yeah. Um, what are the costs to, per acre to, or well, for a bushel of corn? A, a, a unit of corn uh, 80, is 80,000 seeds, uh, roughly $300 probably an average. Um, and, and that'll do like, depending on your population that you want, about like 2.3 acres per 80,000 units. So um, something like that, and uh, soybeans, um, maybe in the $50 range for 140,000 seeds, and that doesn't quite do an acre for me, but it does an acre and a tenth or twelfth, yeah. twentieth of one for uh, Leo. So. Yeah. so, how do you know when it's ready to go to the field plant? When the, the ground is right, you mean, or when? How, how do you determine when you want to plant? Oh, what, what um, do you go for? so so there's a there's a hard deadline that a lot of guys follow, and that is your crop insurance. Uh, uh, plant uh, early planting date and so um, that date has changed every year by your crop insurance and you'll see a lot of guys go to the field that day or the day after hmm. um, and that allows you to uh, basically be covered on crop insurance in case you'd have to replant if it froze off or anything of that nature. How do they decide that? How does the crop insurance, how are they deciding what that date's going to be? Average date. Yeah, and, and, it, it, and it moves and it moves up. Uh, you know, varieties of corn and varieties of soybeans are more tolerant to um, colder soils than they used to be. And uh, used to be years ago, I think you know May there was a lot of corn planted. And I mean, if you're not planting middle half of April to the beginning of May corn, you're behind the eight ball now. I mean, why are you behind the eight ball? Well, soil temperature. Soil temperature. We like getting soil temperature. 50 degrees is six inches. I, I, I would say the number one reason why you're behind the eight ball is because of moisture. Our moisture comes between uh, May and end of June, we get 4th of July. And if you get uh, your growing season earlier, you get more rain during growing season. And more, more rain, okay, so that makes me more. That makes you, your plant, plants healthier, which makes them grow better, which makes more yield. So, um, if you planted in the end of May, you would see a, a big reduction of yield because of that rain is already, yeah. you're, 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 you're not, you're, so it used to be knee high by the 4th of July yeah. for corn, you always hear, now it's shoulder high. Okay. Uh, that's kind of been the rule anymore is it's almost shoulder high. And uh, that corn is utilizing all that moisture before it's shoulder high and then it's got enough in the subsoil to push it through July, and then you're starting to die after the end of July. If your if your soil is not 53 degrees, that corn will not grow. 53 degrees is the magic number. <laughs> 53 to 86. That's a four inch soil temperature. That is anything up lower than 53, that corn's not gonna grow. Anything above 86, air temperature wise there, that corn is done growing. It All it is doing is just sweating moisture out. That it's transpiring, it's just, I just need to keep cool and stay alive. That's why you'll hear KICD, uh, and the soil temperature at the yeah. four inch level is whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and the other thing too to determine is if it's, the soil is too wet, you don't want to yes. go out there when it's too wet. Yeah, because yep. if you run it in, it'll smear the walls of the, mm -hmm. where the planter goes through, it'll put sidewall smear, the roots can't go sideways, they can only go down, and that's not gonna work out too well either. So it's basically gardening on a large scale. It is, it's gardening on a large scale. Yeah, change changed the subject. Do you have any encounters or problems with wild animals? Hmm. What? Wild animals. Wild animals. Deer. Um, well, no. badgers, uh, they are a, they're a curse to us. Okay, what do they do? Well, they, they uh, dig holes in the soil and, and put big, uh, six to eight inch mound of dirt all around the hole. Uh, bad, um, I have land that's next to government ground and uh, gophers 
in the pheasants uh, last two years ago, I lost uh, 12 rows a half mile long. Wow. That they come, you can find a little hole. They they know that kernel as they they go down and eat the kernel. And, and ge that's out of my geese, farm. Uh, geese in soybeans will really? eat the oh, soybeans God. off like grass. You know, like they just keep them mowed off. So uh, deer are somewhat of a problem. Uh, uh, where Barb's uh, son farms and their farm, they're right next to Little Sioux River, just off of it, and they destroy acres and acres of they eat the kernels off the cow and knock the stuff down. Certain animals, it's you know, like the, I say, the badgers, uh, they're they're a real pain because you you drop in with the tractors and stuff like that, uh, and deer. Can't you the gophers on the pardon. Can't you disc those holes in them? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be honest, you do. But uh, yeah, I can disc them in, and two days later they're back there, the dirty devils. <laughs> I need to go out there at night, and get a night scope, and take care of them. But, uh, Codes are also a big problem. Codes? Um, we. This last year, never, we've never had a problem with coons. Uh, my son went out to check on the field, and there was this area, a large area, where the corn was completely flat. Huh. Coons had come in and, and just they just throw it down, and it breaks off. Yeah. And, yeah, and then when you actually went out to combine, it was an even larger area. I farm along the river, uh, one of my fields is, and uh, I have beavers. Oh. Come in and they they just chew the corn plant off and take it to their uh, to make to make their dams. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's a little disappointing, but it's not a huge area. But uh, you know, it might be the size of uh, this room or something. Mm -hmm. You know. Now we've run the hour, but we're glad to answer any more questions you have. If if you have, we, uh, did you go through your list? So we got. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we got. We I think we got through our, our whole spiel. So. Yeah. <laughs> I got. Uh, I get to do my preaching on no till, so that's that's what they say. The best. That last. <laughs> but it's kind of you to ask the question. Really enjoyed it, uh, and come back uh, next week. Who is it next week? They'll be better than we were. Mike Mauer and Steve Steinbeck. Mike and, Mike and Steve. Sign Mike up. and Steve, okay. Planting and spray, okay. Harvesting side and beef. beef. Yep. One more comment with Leo talking about uh, no-till. My son strip tills, and yes, you do need a strip till machine, which is not cheap, to do the strip tilling. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a special machine. Got to have colders to make a trench and. Uh, uh, and it's, it's not a cheap piece of equipment, and it takes horsepower. Yes. <laughs> uh, mine is, since my so I'm tempted to try it, but man, the, the a D it. slope is, is steep, <laughs> and I don't want the soil to go downhill. Uh, so, uh, well, we've talked about maybe going out and uh, strip tilling, but when it comes to hill, raise it up and just put the fertilizer in the trench. Are right on top of the ground. Uh, Casey and I have talked about that. I may try it sometime. But uh, it's working. I just spread the fertilizer on top of the ground and it's working for me. Uh, uh, my yields are uh, comparable. Uh, I know I don't get the yields these guys do around here, but it's a whole different, whole different soil type. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm not going. I'm not going broke until this year. <laughs> so anything else? Well, thank you. Appreciate yes, it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to say thank you guys for coming, and thank you, Leo and Tyler. Appreciate it. Thank you, SMU. And we'll see you back next Wednesday mm -hmm. for Mike Maurer and Steve Steinbeck. Bring more people. Yes. Tell everyone. Thank you.